Welcome back to the Rhonda Swan Show. We are here in my beautiful studio in Bali, Indonesia. It is a beautiful winter day in July. Don't be mistaken that it's cold. <laughs> but I am so thrilled to introduce this week's guest. She is a powerhouse woman, an international best-selling author, transformational speaker, athlete, podcaster, multi-million dollar CEO and business owner whose passion is to spread her message of living a life of confidence, courage, and clarity of purpose. Kate McKay is a high energy, results-oriented performance, fitness, and health coach, as well as a transformational speaker and best-selling author. As a lifelong high performer, Kate understands how to help her clients reach beyond what is comfortable in order to create lives they love. We love this. And she is here with us to share her story and her secrets. Kate McKay, welcome to the show. I am beyond thrilled to be here. This is so wonderful. I feel like I'm in Bali right there with you. So oh. thank you so very much for having me. Well, we wish you were here and we will get you here in the studio one day. But for now, we're just going to enjoy ourselves um, across the world. Um, but you know, Kate, it's so cool because you and I actually just spent some time in New York City together. You were filmed on the new New to the Street Unstoppable show at NASDAQ. How was that experience for you? I love that question. Well, first of all, I have always felt as though I didn't belong. I always felt that there was a sense about me that I was just different, mm. right? And I think a lot of people who are sort of different and unique and are high performers, there is not much resonance in necessarily, even in your family of origin, which mm. is a strange thing. Yeah. But really when I, I met you and I met the group and um, I, it was just such an incredibly positive experience. I felt like I was coming home, you know, know, in the middle right? of Times Square, but it was a really wonderful experience to be around other really powerful, kind, generous women who love on each other and are supporting each other. It, that was a, a, a big, massive shift for me. So I'm well, it was, and you know, that's when I really intimately got to learn about you. And I mean, Kate, some of the conversations you were having, not only with myself, my team, the producers of the NASDAQ show, like you really brought them into an emotional state. And I was like, wow, there's so much power behind that. And I, I really love who you are and what you represent. I mean, obviously your energy, energy is so contagious, but can you share with us like a little bit more about your journey and how you've overcome adversity to really get to this point to where you are today? Absolutely. So I, I often um, introduce myself as one of nine children because I think it's so significant for people who have a uh, or from a big family. It's an experience in mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And so I was six of nine. I have five brothers and three sisters. And I'm the um, you know I'm the youngest girl, so it was sort of an ideal uh, placement. But you know I had always I didn't know what it was, but I think I was always ADHD because in school, like at home, I just had fun. I knew I was here to entertain my mother. I just was outside all the time. But then school, all of a sudden, yeah. it was like Katie, sit down. Katie, stop talking. You know, Katie, turn around. And and it was me and the boys who were getting yelled at. So I was like, am I like a boy? Like I had this identity that maybe. I was like a boy. So hey. it was just this weird thing. And it it was uncomfortable. Um, but then what happened is something my mother saw something in me. And out of the nine kids, um, she didn't want me to go on the parting route that the rest of my siblings did. So she, she shipped me off to private high school when I was a junior in high school. And I was a fish out of water. I was surrounded by some incredibly talented people. I was humbled beyond measure. Uh, being a writer, it's interesting. I got a, my first paper was like a B plus in idea, a D minus in composition. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? But ultimately what that experience was for me, what was so pivotal about it is I found theater. Mm. And, and the basis of theater is all, I get an A. I got an A for just listening to people and responding authentically and actually caring. Yeah. Like that's what gives you an A. I'm like, I'm kind of like that. I kind of love people. I love people's stories because in people's stories, what they're not saying, I hear, mm. I hear the emotion in the story that's beyond words. And, 
And I, there's this gift and this ability of being able to tap in to people's, um, their suffering, but also their greatness. And it's, it is the most highest honor that I have. It's what I do every day. Um, it's my greatest passion. Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, I mean, growing up, we all, I, I was very similar. I felt like you were kind of telling my story too, you know, and, and it's interesting how we handle certain adversities or the way we have looked at adversity. Will you, like, let's, I want to dive more into like what type of adversities you've uh, challenges you've overcome because I think it really positions you well to why you're doing what you're doing now. You know, like there's some recent occurrences that have taken place within your family that you know have given you uh, their challenging times, right? Would you be open to sharing that because I think um, oh, hundred really, percent, yeah. yeah, yeah. So actually, you know, um, there's been a couple pivotal positions. Um, one of them actually was the 1987. So I was, um, my, I was, as I said, number six, my younger bra mother, my brother, Matthew, um, he was just 18 months younger than me. Okay. So he was stunning, gorgeous, hubba hubba, right. But he was always in trouble. So my job was always to be like, don't look at what Matt's doing, you know, because I was his deflector yeah, because right. I was the light, the positivity up. one. But I knew Matt was always like, you know, getting a little bit of trouble. And um, and that really was our whole life that it was like I sort of felt like I was his protector. Uh, but what happened in 1987 is my brother ran a very fast life mm. and uh, and life caught up to him. And unfortunately, uh, he was murdered uh, in 1987. Wow. And. This is the thing that's so incredible about it, Rhonda, mm. is even at that point in time, my parents were separated, okay? And I was there when my mother got the call. And I was like, what's going on? What's happening? And she was in that numb oh. brief state. And I said, where's dad? Mm. And they were li weren't living together. And she said, the police are on their way to his house. So I said, are you okay? I'll be right back. So I went to my dad's. And I told my dad and, and I remember it's like, it's Matthew. Mm. And he's like, he's dead. And I had to be that person. And I remember his keys clanging on the floor and I'll never forget that. Mm. And what was so pitiful and it gives me goosebumps even yeah, thinking about too. it now. How did I know at 23 years old that I was the bridge between my parents because they couldn't be there for each other. Yeah. So I was the one that was in that position of, holding this space, this bridge. Um, and, you know, when something like that happens, when you lose someone so close, it can either unify you yeah. or it can blow families apart. And by all appearances, you would have thought that my family, because we were loud, we were fun, we were all a little crazy, we loved music and dancing, but it blew my family apart. And, sure. and my mother really wasn't able to regain Rhonda from, yeah. from that loss. I mean, she became, um, you know, what a lot, a lot of people do lose their children, mm. you know, they'd be uh, drinking and, you know, and, and turning that inward and that, and that grief and that anger inward. And we all lo live with that. Um, and then um, I, well, <laughs> we bring it up to 2017 and um, my, my angel, my light, my oldest son, um, my son, Will, um, yeah, it's tough when I bridge the two oh. because Will committed suicide as his friends describe it. He, um, he ascended on his own accord. So my son, Will made a choice and I'm telling you the reason why I say it like that is Will was conscious and, and I hold on every day, the light in me is knowing that the light was will and yeah. he showed me the way he was a portal uh to this spiritual knowingness that i walk through every day and that's why i'm so committed honestly yeah. to the stories of other people because if i can hear one person if i can see them and say that is so beautiful that part of you that you're ashamed of or you want to you know keep quiet it's beautiful and um yeah, that's 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 what I do. Mm. I don't care. It's just like feet on the floor every day. Yeah. I live in, in that experience. So, yeah, it's it's pretty, it's pretty heavy, wild. You know, story. And, and I thank you so much for sharing it, Kate, because, you know, this is like when when I met you and I just was like, wow, this woman is so beautiful and dynamic. And it's like you're right. Like it's the story that comes and where does the motivation come from? Right. It's these these moments in our life that that help us, you know, find who we are and how we can be, mm -hmm. bring the light that they had, 
into others' lives because right now, like, you know, uh, you've, uh, you've got your, you know, your daughter, I'm uh, kind of lay. It's like mental health is so big in our kids and, and, and adults. It's like, it's so much awareness that we have to have. And, you know, it, you never know what's going to take place. So this is why I love your work so much. And I know that you've got a pretty different style, if you wouldn't mind, if we kind of switch into this, because you said a couple things. You're like, I can listen to someone's story and I hear something that they're not saying. And I know that you really help and empower them and by using like, you know, outcome kind of based tools so they can address, you know, address certain things. Can you share a little bit about the tools and, and why they're so important? So just one piece in, in um, sort of wrapping that story about a grief and loss, um, because that does actually relate to, to the follow up question. And that is we are, I believe we are born into energy there is such a thing as family karma, right? So we're, it's born through us in generations. So my mother lost her son. She didn't deal with the loss of her son. And the irony that my son was 22 and my brother was 22 and my mother was 54 and I was 54 is, is a story. Yeah. And what I chose to do is choose that as a resurrection of healing, mm -hmm. that it was my choice to heal. And the story ends with me, right? Yeah. And I am going to transmute. And it freaked people out. Because the bottom line is, is that people don't in some ways want you to be okay, yeah. because that means they have to maybe change the way that they perceive loss and grief. And for me, I believe in obviously in post-traumatic stress, it's a real condition, mm -hmm. but I also even more profoundly believe in post-traumatic transformation. We are here to transform grief and our tragedy into a, a beautiful story. And I believe that's the way we honor those people that have passed. Yeah. We can honor them. Yeah. Now that so, I've never heard mm -hmm. anyone call PTSD. And I think that's, we need to reframe it, right? Like reframe it mm -hmm. from the negative, like that label where people are like, this is what I have to, this is what you can be and do. Huge. Yeah. So share, let's share, let's talk about this CPI method, leadership methodology. Yeah. Got. Like how do you help your clients? I know you work with a lot of men, right? Of course, women as well, but you work with a lot of men and um, how do you work them through this? Because like this is all of these elements are like really tying together and pure transformation and, and into, you know, high performance success. Well, it's all theater, right? I mean, it truly is because you're dropped into any experience with the, as either in, in business or in life. And it's like, how are you going to play in this space? Mm. How are you going to respond authentically and be present? Yeah. And again, that's the gift of theater training. It's what I built my multi-million dollar company with by being present and, and being honest and living a life of integrity, which is being, you know, it's all the, all the pieces of presence. How do you honor another person mm. is to show that you're here. I'm, I don't care what's going around me. Oftentimes I'll be in a restaurant. I don't notice anything <laughs> because I'm just like, wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, but, but the gift of that actually and how it translates into the work as both a strategist and a high performance coach is that ultimately people will come to me for a variety of reasons, right? I believe I'm an athlete by, by nature. My training is I'm athletic. Um, I'm committed to being my highest and best. And that really has helped me obviously in the management of my ADHD, but it's also translated into a success mindset mm, and yeah. it's, it's direct link. It really, really truly is. And can you teach grit? I'm not so sure you can, but I can tap in and give people tools on how to be more gritty and more determined. Uh, certainly I can, right? And I can usually find that in somebody, right? Through their story. So I'll dig a little bit, but usually you can find it. Um, but really, ultimately, I use a science-backed, research-based system. We used to be able to, you know, life coaching used to be like, ah, coaching, blah, blah, right? But we've moved on. We understand so much more about the science mm. of performance yeah. and, and and research on that. And I, I love Brendan Bouchard. He's one of my mentor coaches. And he's created a really incredible program of high performance coaching, which is a, I use it in a mix with my own program. But really, if you're coaching people that are high performers, they measure outcome and I'm all about giving it to them. So that's a really rewarding part. We can use both our left brain and our right brain. And I'm, you know, as I said, I'm a gym rat. 
I, I, I was in a gym in the eighties when there was no women. And I remember I used to go to this yeah. gym and it was like in, across the hall from a, a, you know, a boxing gym. And, you know, it was disgusting, but if I had to use the bathroom, I had to ask one of the dudes in the gym, like, Hey, can you watch the door? And they were so proud. They would stand there, you know, like legit, this is real. This is a real story. No women squatted. They didn't, you didn't see women at the squat rack, right? So this was sort of like, even then I never fit in, right? So mm. it was always that thing. But I, why I bring up that story is I've been so, I have five brothers. I'm used to testosterone energy. It doesn't, I'm not afraid of it. It's, it's safe for me. I think that I'm always like people like, I don't want to go in a gym with all guys. I'm like, why? They're not going to bother you. And in fact, if something happens, they're going to be the first one to protect you. Right. And they're not comparing and contrasting you. Mm. Right. I mean, that's a lot of the challenges of being um, it, with other women. Oftentimes is there's this competitive thing, which I just don't understand or get or mm. play in. So that's been the benefit of doing high performance coaching because you have to meet the energy. Mm. And I, I'm really comfortable with it. And I think that if you can be honest and direct and meet that energy, boy, there's a lot of respect and trust that gets built. And I'm not afraid to call them out. Even though like, I'm telling you, when I coach men, oftentimes I'm sweating a little bit right? <laughs> because it's intense yeah. because you're having yeah. to meet the energy. Yeah. And it's very, it's very thrilling, very p powerful work. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, now, a similar, very similar story to me, right? I, I was in the gym and worked with all the guys and, you know, even with my more so transformation in how I work and the things that I do and now I'm working, working more with women. Would you say, do you, do you have a challenge with working with women? And, and why do you think they're, that, that's still present, you know, where like this like energy of women like don't just mesh together? Like, what do you, what do you think that, where that's coming from? Well, I think that it all goes to frequency, right? So yeah. I have less people around me that don't um, see the light in me, right? And I think it yeah. it's a process of discernment. This is a word, peeps. Discernment is huge. It's, it's discernment emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Mm. It's a spiritual practice, discernment. You know, why am I here? And who are the people that are going to light me up and support me? And that takes a while. Because if you're used to being disrespected mm. in your family of origin or in relationship, it takes a while to trust and lean in and believe ultimately that as women in particular, we have the gift. And the gift is we are a divine source and we are the gifted one that we are built to receive emotionally, mentally and spiritually. We are the receivers. We are reciprocals. And how wonderful. And to me, that's the greatest thing. I love being a woman. And I love being a woman. And I love other women. And I think that I attract that that type of woman now that wants to play an A game too. And it's wonderful. And they used to call it alpha yeah. women, but I, I'm all about uh, renaming that. It's it's not it's not alpha women. It's just women who are strong that love other women and want to support other women and men. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, it's, I, I'm seeing the, the transition, right? I mean, it's because I, you know, we were all, we were born into society that pretty much told us to compete with each other, right? Especially us, this alpha, this, you know, a uh, high performance type of woman, like we were always competing with the guys, you know, and that's kind of how I grew up. I was just competing with the guys. I'm like, look, you can come with me. I don't, I don't dislike you, but you can come with me if you want. However, I, there was always at, at a cost. Like I really never had really good connections with women until I started to understand the difference between like a masculine and a feminine energy and how to embrace mm -hmm. that. Can you kind of hit on that and, and your, maybe that's, your experience? That's beautiful. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that because that requires a level of transparency because it's true. Yeah. Because you're like, no, I want to do things and I want to talk about ideas and I want to run and play and I don't want to talk about other people. You're right. Because that's a lot of the conditioning. Mm -hmm. It's biology. It's biology. And in fact, I was interviewed on a podcast, this Australian, uh, Austrian guy today. And he was like, well, what happens? Like my wife wants to talk to me and it's like, she's going on and on and on. And it's really uncomfortable for me. But then now we just walk and it's so much better. And I said, why do you think that is? And he goes, I don't know why. And I said, because men are built that if you're sitting across, you're meeting energetically to the front, it's combative. Mm. And they are looking to solve your problem or take you down. Right. Biologically, people, this isn't men can't communicate. It's how are we honoring men in the way that they communicate and the women communicate. And this is the tip for women that 
If you want a man to just listen to you, then you say, babe, can you just listen to me? Just hear me out. I just got to talk. I got to talk this through. You don't have to solve don't anything. Solve Guess what the guy's going to do? Woo! Sweet. You're going to talk and his eyes are going to glaze over. And maybe it's not super interesting, but he's going to honor you because a man does want to please you. Yeah. But you've got to, you got to, you got to say what you need. Women have as much trouble speaking their need as men. Yeah. I hate to say it. In this yeah. new generation of where we are yeah. at, it is a whole new language, intimacy. And uh, how do we honor the masculine and the feminine in this new era? Yeah, I mean, this is this is real, right? I mean, and there's such a big awakening as well. Like I'm seeing super high alpha women that are like really embracing, you know, their femininity. And then I'm also seeing the men like just not needing to be a dude, you know, like they think they get to show up like this and that makes them masculine. I'm like, that's opposite of it. That's you trying, right? Like, let's start embracing each other. And I, I, I love this. And I, that's why I always love having these conversations with women that are, we're just driven, right? And, and I, you know, my mission, I want to bring more of these women together with me and allow and to showcase that we should support each other because we create a lot of magic when we're together. And, you know, that old way of young girls not liking each other or picking on each other like this is just garbage you know it's like that's just social media that's conditioning that's environmental programming that has to go away and you know I so agree. yeah so i really appreciate you sharing that so um i mean obviously i know that you're you, you were talking earlier about your fitness and and how that really really connects directly to your success and you know your the, the, you, that how you coach your clients can you give them some advice because i think a lot of people they compartmentalize success with wealth and this, but you really connect your fitness, your mindfulness, right? Your health into impacting your business. And I think that the, you know, the listeners would really get a lot of value if you could share with them how you see that connect and how they can really uh, use it to impact their business. Well, health is wealth, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the studies have shown, right? And when you look at even CEOs, they're as conditioned, the most successful could, um, CEOs are as conditioned as NFL players. Mm -hmm. You have to be at a high frequency to be successful. And if one of the high performance habits is energy, and it's a place where I have a level of mastery. Mm. And so it's like, how are you managing your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual energy? How are you using it? How are you, in, how are you restoring it? It's a, it's a finite amount and it's, it's our gift. And it's our, it's the vessel. This is the, ve this is the holy vessel that we are given to move through life. And I heard this very interesting podcast last night. Huberman's my favorite, Andrew Huberman, for any of you interested in neuroscience, he mm -hmm. is incredible. He's out of Stanford, but he said, you got to like backtrack your last 10, you know, your last decade. And what do you want in that last decade? And how do you want to live your life? And that mm. just was a reset for me of, yeah. man, we're in trouble. We're actually approaching a time where we are not going to be as healthy as the future, mm. as the generation in front of us, mm -hmm. which is an interesting perspective. So what I would say about the whole thing, um, you know, I, about health and embracing that is that you deserve it. And is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to be hard? Yes. Is life hard? Yes, indeed it is. <laughs> mm. Is it, can we bring the joy anyway? Absolutely. And I think that that's the, you have to understand that you are going to meet resistance. You are going to be afraid. You are going to have people who are going to push back. You are going to lose something or someone because you've been courageous enough to put yourself in the center of your life because you were given a divine gift that no one else was given. Mm, I you. love that, Kate. Thank you for that. Wow, that was like really grounded and centered. But it's it is true. Like if you think about it, I, you know, I I've been in I don't know probably two hundred, three hundred entrepreneurial events. You know, and you know, we when someone walks on a stage and they are they're put together, their body looks healthy, their skin, their eyes are beaming. Like I just lean in, right? I lean in and to listen. You know, because I don't. I always listen to someone that is doing something bigger or better than I. And that's just a, a lesson I learned in being an entrepreneur. Like, you know, be, lift yourself up so that others can also lift themselves up. And, you know, but having a good health is, it, it, it's, it's what shows that you care about yourself. You care about the moment in the, in the body that you've been given. 
And you know, I think that that is it's overlooked a lot. You know, like success people can. How do you celebrate it too, right, well, Rhonda? A, yeah, for sure. It's supposed to be a celebration. Yeah. It's yeah. like sexuality and sensuality are supposed to be fun. Yeah, right. What is it that we're making things that are supposed to be joyous so, so heavy taboo and heavy? Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't have to be. I mean, that's why I wrote the book Living Sexy Fit, which I'm naming it Claim Your Inner Hottie. Yes. But it's just I, I wrote the book because it's supposed to be funny. Mm. And people actually took me serious. I was like, you think I'm serious? It's like what I'm talking about is how do you claim that part of you inside that lights you up? Mm. Where is the longing? We have to tap into the longing. It's not taboo. It's what brings us joy. Hmm. And in fact, a after the Holocaust, and they they, they did a survey on the people who kept the blinds closed, and then the person people that decided to love anyway. And man, that's a powerful study. And it's actually. Um, Oh, I can't remember her name. She's a phenomenal psychologist. She's Belgium, but she writes a lot about men, women, and intimacy. She's phenomenal. And she wrote that story about, you know, the observation that we can still bring the joy, even through the darkest times. Mm -hmm. We can choose that. We all have the power to choose. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love this conversation, Kate. We could keep talking forever and ever, but we do need to close up. So can you share with everyone, like, how do they find you? Like, what is happening for you right now? And um, yeah, how can they look this woman up? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Rhonda. I really, truly appreciate this time. I'm deeply honored to be sharing this space with you. And, um, you know, just going back just briefly to that point about being the feeling like you're a lone wolf and feeling like, but I want to go where the fun is and where things are happening and I'm alone and looking around. I'm like, how come people can't celebrate each other? But you truly have created that space. And mm -hmm. I'm just deeply honored to be part of that. And it wasn't a small calling, Rhonda. Yeah. You know, this, this isn't a small calling of everything that you have around you. And I just know, um, and I hope you deeply know that you have so many people that support and love you and have your back and are here living lifting you up as you rise. So thank you very, very much. I receive that. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just uh, people can find me at, uh, at kate-mckay.com. I have a podcast, Master Your Life with Kate McKay. I'm very excited about the new title, which I've switched off from Survive to Thrive, because ultimately right now we're in an incredible time. And the people who are most productive, who are leaning in, who are being the service leaders, these are the people that are going to actually be the game changers. So be that game changer. And again, once again, thank you. And thank you for listening to viewers and listeners. Oh, Kate, you're amazing. Thank you. And to our audience, you know, please be sure that you follow Kate, right? These are, are important topics that we're discussing, right? Not only just high performance, but what's the back and how are you using your story or your adversity to help add impact or to help change the world with your gifts? Like this is the possibilities that we have. And when we look at ourselves and we, we take ourselves, you know, not so seriously, we protect our bodies, we clear our minds and we look at what am I here for? Like really, what am I here for? And if you can't look at yourself in the mirror and say, you are doing amazing things with your life. I love you. Then let's change that story. Rewrite the story, right? You know, well, you have the opportunity, if you just can imagine yourself, just imagine you being God and you are doing something that you just don't love or it's not working. God's like, actually, that is not working. God's like, I'm just going to destroy that. What's going to happen? You're going to recreate <laughs> it because you're God. You're a creator. Mm -hmm. So just know you don't have to stick in that story. You don't have to keep doing the things that you don't love or not feeling your joy. You're God of your own destiny. Shift it, change it, let it go and create. So I hope everyone got an amazing message from today's show. It is always my honor to be here in beautiful Bali, Indonesia, and to be able to share this space with you. Kate McKay, thank you again for being here, and I look forward to seeing all of you on the next show. So don't forget to be unstoppable and stay wild. Bye, everyone. <laughs>